good church say praise the Lord. Why don't you close your eyes and lift your voices to the Lord across this place and just thank Him for what He's done in your life. He brought you out. He was there when you needed Him. He said, I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. When others let you down, He'll never let you down. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to introduce my wife to you tonight. She'll be flying out in the morning. She has to go to New York. She'll be speaking this weekend in several services herself. So I'll be with you one more night. Uh, but since she's leaving after tonight, I want to give her a chance to greet this congregation. Praise the Lord, everyone. I greet you in Jesus' name. It is so good to be with you. I just want to leave you one word. I've been praying for you every... I've been getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning here. And I've been praying for you. Take what you have got out of this revival. Take it with all you got. And let it change you. You know, it's nice coming in every night. And, oh, we had great church. And it did something. But let it change you. Let it change you. Let it empower you to pray more. Let it empower you to read the Bible more. It's not just enough to come in and say, oh, we had good three nights. But let it change you. Because I promise you, if it lets you, you let it change you, you're going to be a different person. You're going to win some battles. You're going to get some healings. You're going to get some signs and wonders and miracles. You're going to get a word. But you got to let it change you first. Love and blessings. Well, praise the Lord. She's our secret weapon. The reason she's getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning is because she runs a 6 o'clock in the morning prayer call with about 150 ladies on it. But that's 6 a.m. Florida time. <laughs> Makes it 3 a.m. California time. She's been doing that for right going on four years and has uh, just made a profound impact in our lives and our ministry and all those that are joining with her every morning in prayer. And uh, what a delight it has been for us and a joy to be invited to come to True Vine, be a part of these special services, have a chance to fellowship up close with pastor and his wife we've had some good meals together good fellowship had a great time talking about the things of the lord and uh, life in general and uh, i i am needing some of them shoes i'm an old soul i've been i've been looking dressing like an old man since i was 35 so I, i'm not ready for them socks but i think i could I think I could get a little wild side and do the shoes. Get me a red watch band to match it. I was really getting out there when I bought that silver one. I mean, just taking a walk on the wild side. What a joy it has been to be here. Can feel the good presence of the Lord. What God is doing with you and through you at this strategic hour. And uh, there are a lot of battles to fight and hills to climb. And we're battling not only as a church and spiritual things, but individually in our homes and our families, personal, just living in life, and our personal walk with God. And that's one of the blessings of being part of a church. You can come into an atmosphere where there's the strength of everyone's praise and everyone's prayer that helps lead us into the deeper things of God. I greet the saints from Spring Valley. I think we might have a few that came tonight, and we're glad you're here. And all of those that are watching online, part of this online revival, we certainly greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. One verse of Scripture, Psalm 37, verse 4. I do preach with a timer. Most of the time I pay attention to it. Of course, I control it, so sometimes I pause it. 
And then I started back up again. I realize you're in the middle of your work week, and I will be conscious of your schedule. Psalm 37, 4. One verse. Delight thyself also in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Perhaps an unlikely title from that verse, but I'll make the connection along the way. I want to preach to you tonight, doorways to the supernatural. I feel like the kind of message that I want to bring to you tonight will open up doorways for destiny, set some things in motion that many years from now we'll still be experiencing. Sometimes one event, one service is just the first domino to fall. Years down the road, the impact is still felt. Lord Jesus, I pray you touch everyone. Those that are weak in faith, struggling, weak in body, need a miracle of healing, need a divine touch. I pray, Lord, that you administer in various ways throughout this message and especially in the season of the altar call. I pray let this message capture somebody's thoughts, bring them under full submission to your will and your way in our life. Lead us to the place you'd have us to go. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. And with a loud voice, everybody said in Jesus' name. Oh, that felt about halfway. Let's just say it. Come on, let's. In Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I have been very blessed in my lifetime since the story I told you on Sunday, 19 years old, coming to the Lord, uh, giving myself completely away. I have been very blessed to have discovered the will of God in at least the most major areas of life. I've certainly not done the will of God in every circumstance, every situation, every time. But in the most major areas of life, I have been blessed to have discovered the will of God and done the will of God. And as a result of it, I have been blessed to become an eyewitness to some of the most amazing miracles, signs and wonders that the Lord is doing in this season of the latter rain that we are entering into, moving into the end time. One of the secrets of it is learning the secret of the verse that I read tonight. Delight thyself in the Lord, and He will give you the desire of your heart. That does not mean that God's just going to give you whatever you want. This is not a Santa Claus verse. It's not a Burger King verse. Doesn't mean you can have it your way. Doesn't mean that if you're a good saint, your faith will give you tithes and offering, live for God. You can just make your list of all the stuff you want. Louis Vuitton, new Lexus, house by the water. Here it is, God. You said if I would delight myself in you, you'd give me everything I want. I really don't think that is the meaning at all of the verse. What I have discovered that it means is this. When you delight yourself in the Lord, the blessing of the verse is the desire itself. He causes you to desire the things that is going to lead you to the ultimate blessing he has in mind. He'll put it in your heart to want to go the right direction. He can put it in your heart to want to be in the house of God. He can put the desire in your heart to know the word of God, the desire in your heart to pray. Whatever it is that would lead you to his ultimate blessing and his will being fulfilled, the blessing of this verse is that he can give you the desires that lead you there. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. God can put the hunger there. He can put the thirst there. It's very, very possible that God can cause you to want to do the very thing that is going to please him the most. 
We come out of the world and into the church. We come with all the desires of the world and the things of the world. But one of my early prayers was, God, put the desire in me to do what's right. True freedom is just not doing anything you want to do. True freedom is the power to do the right thing to do. I want to do the right thing. Not just anything, the right thing. And so when you walk in the Spirit, the will of God becomes more automatic. When you walk in the Spirit, the will of God becomes more natural, more intuitive. You just almost instinctively do the thing that is in line with what God has for you. I've walked through some spiritual doorways in my lifetime that led me to some mighty miracles. 1996, I was in Papua New Guinea. My wife went with me on this particular crusade. We were traveling with Brother Cole in those days. And in that, in that crusade that night, that Sunday night service, it was the first time that Brother Cole put me forth to preach, said, speak the word of faith, pray for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I did those things. The power of God fell. We had over 3,000 receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost that night in that crusade. And right at the moment that the people began to lift their hands and worship and the Holy Ghost was being poured out and 3,000 people were receiving the Holy Ghost, we were in an outside stadium. A cloud of His presence come look like a waterfall rolling over the side wall of that, of that stadium. And it came in and hovered over all the people. Now this was a glory cloud that everybody could see. We caught it on video. It's still on my website to this day. We got photographs of it. Everybody in the congregation could see it. We had about 11,000, 10, 11,000 people there that night. People in the city. We were in the city of Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea. And people in the city could see the glory cloud over the stadium. They were parking their cars and stopping and looking and pointing. It was just a hovering glory cloud, a physical, literal cloud of the presence of God. I'm glad I was there that night. i tell you something unique about how that happened. The Lord spoke to me through the day. said, tonight I will give you a sign uh, of my glory and of my power. So when I got up to preach, I prophesied to the people. I said, I'm going to preach to you tonight. God's going to give us a sign. I prophesied to you, God is going to give us a sign of his power. When I was prophesying that in my mind, I thought I was prophesying the sign of speaking with other tongues. Because I was fully expecting that many people would receive the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues. So I prophesied with that intent. So I didn't even know what I was prophesying. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now what I prophesied was correct. What I thought the prophecy meant was not correct. Because God... It often does things that are bigger than our brain. They're outside the understanding of our intellect. I'll give you an example. On a Saturday morning, years later in Ethiopia, preaching to that giant crowd in Ethiopia of 300, 400,000 people, people so deep you couldn't even see to the back of the crowd, about eight football fields full of people just packed shoulder to shoulder. It was a great healing service. People were getting healed. We had all kinds of testimonies. We learned the story of one man that was blind way in the back of the crowd, way back there. No way to even see him or know he was back there. Power of God hit that place. Power of God hit him. When the power of God hit him, he did the twirly bird. That's this right here. And the funky chicken. Have you ever done the funky chicken? He got the 220 blessing. That's when you put your finger in a light socket. In America, it's 110, but around the world, it's 220 and 240. And say, so he got this. He could feel him from the top of his head to the sole of his feet to the tips of his fingers from the inside to the outside. But when he got done with all that, he was still blind. <laughs> we uh, had many testimonies. We paused for lunch. Lunch take about an hour and a half. Many of the people had to walk some distance to some local villages, local areas. So they all walked in a group a little ways away, got to the little village. 
They had a fire burning. They had some cabbage on the fire. They handed it out. Everybody bowed their head to pray over the food. Thank God for the cabbage. When he said, thank you, Lord, for this food and lifted up his head, his eyes opened up. Now, I don't know why it didn't happen when he was doing the 220. I don't know why it didn't happen when he was doing the twirly bird. seemed like that would have been the ideal moment. But it does occur to me that evidently something happened to him while he was doing the funky chicken that was still happening to him when he was eating lunch. Can I tell you more happens to you when you're in church than you realize? You don't always see the full measure of the miracle just in what songs we sing, what sermons we preach, and what we feel in the house of God. This is an eternal business. And things can happen to you here that will still be happening to you when you leave here. They can still be happening to you years from now. (laughs) I've seen some miracles. Not always understood how they happen. I was in Pakistan one night. They get very aggressive in Pakistan. Uh, In Papua New Guinea, you walk out in the crowd, look like you're part in the Red Sea. In Ethiopia, you walk out in the crowd, they'll tear you to shreds. Pakistan's the same way. They don't wait for you to walk out in the crowd. They'll just crawl right up on the platform and try to pull you in. So this particular night, we had about 80,000 people in this meeting, and we're preaching the power of God's moving, and it was getting a little wild. (laughs) So I was trying to bring some direction and control to the situation and it was a big old giant platform and they brought a man up on the platform in a wheelchair of course he was way over there to the side and I looked over and they were motioning for me to come over and pray for him but I had pandelirium breaking out here so I just said just a minute (laughs) just just hold on a second and I went back to giving instructions to the crowd trying to bring some kind of order and about that time everything just erupted everything went crazy I'm just going to tell you the honest truth. It kind of frightened me. I was like, what in the world? Trying to bring order and just getting away from me here. And I'm like, what happened? And I turned and looked, and that man is up out of that wheelchair. He'd been in it for six years, and he's doing a number like this right here across the platform. He wasn't walking normal, but he was, he was walking for the first time in six years, learning his way, and the crowd went to praising God. Of course, I went over and laid hands on him, prayed hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Put my arm around him, got a picture. I don't even know how that miracle happened. I told him, wait a second. I don't know if God, if God said, well, if you're a busy preacher, I'll take care of this one all by myself. I don't know if the man said, I've waited long enough. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I'm just glad I was in the right place at the right time. I got to witness the power and the glory of God. I've seen lots of miracles. Some of them made sense. You know, healing line, put some oil on somebody, they get healed. We get that. But some of these miracles happen. I don't even know how they happen. Uh, One time in Ethiopia, for 11 years, at the end of every, we would preach from 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday all the way up to about 4 in the afternoon. Then we'd come back the next day on Sunday Preach from 9 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, preacher after preacher. Every year for 11 years, the last preacher on the last day, the blue sunny skies would give way to rain clouds and it would pour down rain. Well, now because of the drought and dry, deserty conditions of Ethiopia, when the rain would come, they were happy. So they didn't leave. They just shouted in the rain. They would shout and dance in the rain. We had um, put some poles in and some rebar so that we could roll out blue tarp to protect from the sun those would fill up with water (laughs) it was raining the tarps were full of water people were shouting we were getting our stuff to go to the bus so as I was walking over to get my bible and stuff to take it off to the bus I looked down and I saw a man down here in the dirt and he was on his knees swaying a little bit awkwardly Because I'm just familiar with it, been around so much, I knew immediately, okay, he's blind. And just as I was looking at him, and I was getting my Bible, a little gust of wind hit one of those tarps. And the water in the tarp dumped out on the man praying on his knees. And when the water hit him, 
He jumped up and just started dancing around in every direction. I felt sorry for him. I felt sympathy. I thought, that's terrible. He's blind. He, this water now just falls on him. He don't know what happened, where it came from. Water was probably cold. Some of the preachers ran over around him. I thought, well, they'll comfort him. They'll help him. And I started off to the bus. I didn't barely make it to the other side of the platform till I hear microphones and Ethiopian language. And I turned, and they've got this man up on the platform. And they're shouting in the microphones. And I asked my interpreter, I said, what are they saying? He said, they are saying that when the water fell on the man, his eyes opened up, and now he can see. <laughs> Nobody even prayed for him. Nobody even asked God for the miracle. He's getting a mighty miracle, and I'm feeling sorry for him. I obviously didn't have a clue. You're thinking, you know, Pastor, you might want to vet these evangelists a little better before you bring them in here. We need, we need somebody that understands how this stuff works. You know, This guy, this guy obviously don't even know what's going on. He's telling people in wheelchairs to wait a minute, and they're just getting their miracle in spite of him and feeling sorry for a guy that's getting his blind eyes opened up. I'll tell you the worst one, it's not the worst, it's actually the best, the most unique one that I've ever seen in my lifetime. That platform in Ethiopia is made out of concrete. It's about 10 feet tall because the crowd's a half a million people. you got to be pretty high up for them to see you. And uh, when they all get to worshiping and praising God, it's loud. <laughs> I mean, it's really loud. And so if you're standing right beside somebody up here, you're kind of shouting to each other, talking. And I look over, and a whole group of the preachers on the front they're waving like this for me to come over. So I get over there to the edge of the platform. I'm looking way down there. And they've got a man down there uh, on a stretcher. And uh, they're pointing at him. And they're, the interpreter is trying to tell me in my ear that he's uh, paralyzed. He can't move. He can't walk. So I'm thinking, okay, everything's so loud. He can't hear me. Pray for him. So I get right to the edge of the platform. And I go like this right here. I'm wanting them to kind of lift him up a little so that I can catch eye contact. So I'm thinking maybe if he sees me pray, I'll stretch my hand out. He won't be able to hear the words, but he'll see the visual. That might strike some faith into his heart, and I'm going to pray for this man to be healed. The problem was, when I went like this right here, those preachers thought I was raising him up. They thought that's the prayer. Preacher's raising him up. So they lift the guy up on the stretcher, bamboo poles and leather, and they just dumped him out. I am standing there watching this. He slides down. His knees hit and buckle, and he falls over like this right here. He gets about like this. He rolls over like that, jumps up on his feet, starts dancing around. Everybody's... <laughs> and I'm standing there, my heart in a full panic. It was an accident. It was literally an accidental miracle. I was getting ready to pray for him. I wanted to lift him up. I was just getting in place. I was getting ready for my prayer of faith. They thought it was it. Dumped him out and God healed him. I said, preacher, why are you telling us these stories? Because I want you to understand God is not limited to our intellect, to our understanding. God is bigger than your brain. God is bigger than your tradition. God is bigger than the box of how you think the miracle ought to take place. God can do anything he wants, anytime he wants, anywhere he wants, any way he wants. Oh, yes, he can. I would like somebody to say, God, you do my miracle any way you want to do the miracle. I may not understand it. I may be confused the whole time it's happening, but I'll figure it out by the time we get to the end. Woo! God's bigger than our songs. God's bigger than our sermons. God's bigger than our laying on of hands. God's bigger than our anointing oil bottle. He's a God of the universe. I've, I've preached in revival services. Of course, I'm, a, I'm getting a little older. And so I'm not quite as wild as I used to be. But I'm a classic Pentecostal preacher. We get a little loud. We get a little red face. We get a little breathy. We get a little bit like a slobber mouth tree dog. 
<laughs> Power of God gets the moving. I did a service one night. I was young years ago. I was over and it seemed like it was Utah. And I'm way over on this side of the platform. The altar was full of people. And everybody's worshiping God. And I saw an older lady sitting over there on the side. She's just sitting there. She wasn't worshiping God. I don't know. Some God all over hold of me. She ought to be praising God. I pushed my way through the crowd without thinking. I got over to her without looking or paying no attention. I grabbed her and stood her up on her feet. Come on, sister. When she got on her feet, her eyes got big as golf balls. Startled me. She starts going like this. I don't walk. I don't walk. I don't walk. I look down, and sure enough, she got on leg braces from her knees bolted down to her ankles. What I did next, I do not ever recommend from now to the end of time as we know it. When I looked down and saw those leg braces, without thinking, I kicked her. But fortunately for me, I guess God said, I guess he's left me no choice. If I don't heal this lady, he's done. You can't kick grandma unless grandma gets healed. When I kick grandma, she got the shouting. She got the doing like this right here. Power God got on her. I walked her around for a little while. I said, take them leg braces off. She got the leg braces off. We walked around a little more. Thank God. You'd have never heard of me. I'd have been one of them stories. You ever hear about that guy? What was his name? That guy kicked that lady out there. They never did find the body. Grandsons would have showed up and nieces and nephews. They would have took care of me for sure. I don't know why I did that. I've never done it since. Thank God she got healed. I don't know how that happened. Like I said, maybe God felt like he had no choice. I've gotten all upset and wild and crazy in all the services. Somebody come up to me. Would you pray for my mother? Sure. Where's she at? Right over here. I come down there. He's walking in front of me. First person I see, that must be her hands laid. I'm over here praying over mother. I'm prophesying. I'm speaking word. She's getting a great miracle. Holy Ghost moving. I said, woo. He said, that's not her. I said, well, who is she? She's over here. Well, all right. Let's run. You got a free blessing. God bless you. Go your way. Don't even know what's going on. Now, I'm not advocating for foolishness. And that town is, let's just be insane. My point is that God is bigger than our understanding. God's not limited to us getting everything just right. If your heart is right, if you're delighting yourself in the Lord, if your motives are right, if you're pure before God, I'm telling you things are happening around you. You don't even understand how they happen. I hope you figured out I did not perform any of these miracles. I was astonished, surprised, and shocked along with everyone else. But there's one other thing I was. I was led by the Holy Ghost. When I prophesied we're going to have a sign, we had one. Amen. The power of God was manifest in the anointing. I want to tell you something about these doorways to the supernatural. There's good news and there's bad news. You want the bad news first? Most people do. The bad news is they are invisible. You don't know where they are. If we knew exactly where the doorway to the miraculous and the supernatural power of God was here tonight, we could have just streamlined everything. If we knew right when it's going to happen, that's where we'd have just go right for that, skip everything else. But we don't know. We don't know if the doorway is in the prayer room. We don't know if it's in the song service. We don't know if it's right in the middle of the preaching. We don't know if it's in a prayer during the altar service. So we just come and we just get started. And we pray like it's going to happen in the prayer room. And then we worship like it's going to happen in the worship service. Then we preach like it's going to happen in the preaching. And then we pray like it's going to happen in the altar service. Because we don't know where the doorway is. 
That's the difficult part. So we have to delight ourselves in the Lord. Be faithful, sincere, and honest. And have faith that somewhere here, there's a doorway to my miracle. Somewhere here, there is the pathway to my blessing. And I'm just going to be led by God the best I can with a sincere heart. And believe that he's going to get me there. That's the difficult part. Here's the good news. Because they're invisible and you don't know where they are, you could be beside one right now and not even know it. I mean, you could literally be one step away from an invisible doorway that if you just turn like that and walk through, you walk right into a new dimension. That's why you have to be led of the Holy Ghost because sometimes you don't know, should I turn left or should I turn right? Should I go forward or should I just stop right here? What should I do? I don't know. So I've got to be led by the Spirit. That's why we pray. That's why we fast. That's why we try to walk in the Holy Ghost. That's why we try to abide in the Word of God so that I will just instinctively be in the right place at the right moment. God will have divinely ordered my steps uh, that I didn't even know were being ordered of the Lord uh, until suddenly I realized, uh, look what the Lord has done. That's why we're in revival, so we can get sensitive to the move of God. When you delight yourself in the Lord and you're faithful, he'll start putting the desire in your heart to lead you to his will. You'll see the things you're longing to see. You'll find the will of God. You will experience great victory. And I might just throw this in real quick in passing. God's will is better than your will. It's not just more noble. It's better. God's plans for your life are better than your plans for your life. I pastored 12 years. Have people come to me and say, Pastor, we're praying about moving here, moving there, getting this job, doing that job, buying this house, getting that house, do this, do that, do the other thing. What do you think? We don't know what the will of God is. And so you say, well, you know, I really think maybe what you should do is this, 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 and this. And you can tell how disappointed they are. They said, well, we're, we're going to pray. And so they come back a little while later, and it's so sad. I've heard it just like this right here. So sad. Pastor, we've been praying, and we've decided we're just going we're gonna to do the will of God. So sad. It's not what we want to do. We know it's what we should do. We're going to follow your direction, and we're just going to do the, the will of God. And, and, and the unspoken sentiment is, my life could be so much better. If I had just took that job, I'd have so much more money. I'd be so happier. Life would be so grand. But no, we're just going to do the will of God. And what is so deceptive about it is it is not understanding that if you are ever so blessed in life as to have discovered the will of God and do the will of God, you are on the pathway to joy unspeakable and full of glory. God's will is not second best. God's will is not second place. God's will is not some lesser walk in life. God's will is the greatest possibility that it could ever happen to any one of us. That's why I say, Lord, order my steps. Lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I don't want to stray to the left or the right. I'll do anything, go anywhere, be anything, as long as it's your will, because I have learned to trust that God's way is better than my way. God's plan is better than my plan. I learned it in its seed form early in my walk with God, right after I came into the church there and 1984, by 1985, there in the Apostolic Lighthouse, I told you there was a young lady there in the church. You met her tonight, Patricia Ann Windsor. I noticed her. She noticed me. I've always questioned her on that. I said, you know, I was coming in out of the world. You weren't supposed to like me. 
I was being spiritual. I don't know. She was much more serious about those things in those days than I was. I was just kind of coming in, so I was still, you know, a little worldly minded. So, you know, just play in the field. She had a wedding dress in her closet. No, that she really honestly did. She wasn't looking to date. She's looking to get married. I'm just dating. Wouldn't even call it that. <laughs> she, she does not like this portion of the sermon. This brings up bitter memories. So after a little while, she saw I wasn't, you know, let's just be, I was just being a jerk. Okay, just to be as honest as I can. So she, she, after a little while, she just, you know, she gets desperate and she just prays, Lord, is he the one or do I look for another? Ain't no point in wasting my time if he's not going to get with the program. <laughs> Things went on a little while longer and the Lord spoke to her in one of her prayer times and spoke to her directly the verse of scripture that I read tonight. Delight yourself in me, and I will give you the desire of your heart. Well, she interpreted that to mean that was me. <laughs> we went along a little while longer, and I still wasn't getting the message from heaven <laughs> how things were supposed to be going. So she gets a little desperate again, and she prays, and this time... This time she broke all the rules. She did what you're not allowed to do. She'd never do. She said, we're in revival. We were in about an eight, nine week revival. Had church that night. She said, Lord, if he's really the one, let there be tongues and interpretation in church tonight. You can't do that. Just arrange the church service any way you want to to try to get. You just got to come and hope you fall into it somehow. Let them sing this song. Let pastor preach this sermon. Let the evangelist take three steps to the left. Put the microphone in his right hand. Turn and walk the other way. And then I'll know. You can't do that stuff. You'll be off in la-la land somewhere. However, as illegal as it was, we get to church that night and sure enough, there's tongues and interpretation. Oh, it's worse than that. I was trying to be spiritual. And so I gave the interpretation. You ain't even going to believe this next part. When I gave the interpretation, the interpretation of the tongues that my wife has asked for, well, she wasn't my wife yet, had asked for a sign. Went like this. Have not I the Lord spoken to you and said, I will give you the desires of your heart. <laughs> not only was her tongue's interpretation, I now quote what the Lord had already spoke to her about the whole situation. So she comes to me after the service and politely informs me. <laughs> now I was trying to be spiritual. I wasn't entirely spiritual. And so I got mad. I mean, I genuinely got mad. You can't do that. Just arrange the church service. And then come tell me, God's done said, we're getting married. We're going to see the pastor. She's sitting right there. I took her directly to the pastor. Tell him what you have done. <laughs> I'm going to get this fixed. So she explains the whole ordeal. The prayer, the fasting, God said, the tongue's interpretation. I gave it, quoted what God said. My pastor's sitting there looking, <laughs> listening to her, trying to be all dignified. She got to the end, and he, he stammered and stuttered. Well, now, um, you, 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 you have to, uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit. They're, they, they, it's for the church, and, and, and I really don't think that, I, I, I don't believe that God would, would the, the gifts are, 
So the body of Christ, and anybody said, look, I can't say nothing against this. He said, oh, I don't, it just sounded to me like God's done spoke. We need to pay attention. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Amen. You know, it's not the only time things happen. I remember a lady in the scripture that come to the Lord, and the Lord said, it's not fit to take children's bread and cast the dogs. I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She said, yeah, but don't the dogs get the crumbs? He stepped around a dispensation, said, I may not be sent to you, but because of what you just said, I'm going to give you yours anyhow. <laughs> Woo! Come on, God's bigger than our brain. I guess you figured out the rest of the story. We ended up getting married. <laughs> Been married for 36 years. About the best thing ever happened to me besides receiving the Holy Ghost. And I was fighting it the whole time. I love you, but can I just tell you, sometimes you're fighting against the will of God. You're fighting against what God's doing. And you're fighting the very best thing that could ever happen in your life. God's trying to lead you. God's trying to help you. And we're sitting there the whole time fussing with it and fighting about it. And God's saying, if you just delight yourself in me, I'm putting these desires in your heart to lead you where you need to be. Moses is out there. Let me give you a little bit of Bible tonight so at least you know I was preaching from the Bible. Moses is out there in the desert. Sees a burning bush. Well, it wasn't just a burning bush. It was a bush that burned but was not consumed. In other words, the bush burned longer than it should have burned. There's lots of burning bushes, but usually they burn up and burn out. But this one just kept burning, burning, burning. You know, that's how your family's going to know you got something real. When you don't burn out. They thought your little religious experience had about a three-month expiration and three years later, you're still living for God and five years later, you're still on fire when you burn longer than they thought. Come on, when you catch on fire, you're intended to burn on. We're a bush that burns but is not consumed. And after a little while, somebody's going to say, I need to see what's going on with this bush caught on fire and just don't burn out. Out there in the desert somewhere, long blown away by the winds of time is a space that Moses' foot hit the ground. And a thought went through his brain. I will turn aside and I will see this bush. Why it burns and is not consumed. Now that is just sort of an idle curiosity. Not exactly the kind of thought you would think would lead you to great leadership or profound wonders. I don't know if an angel was trying to say, Moses, that way, that way, that way. Not over here, over there. I don't know if God was out there somewhere beyond the thunder. Moses, the bush. All I know is he said, I'm going to turn aside. And from the moment his foot hit that spot and he started through the bush, he became the deliverer of God's people. His destiny started. He walked through an invisible doorway on his way to that bush. There was no billboard in the desert with a red arrow that said your destiny is this way. Turn toward the bush, Moses. Signs, wonders, and miracles are this way. No, he gets over there. The next thing you know, a voice is speaking. The place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. His sandals are off. The voice is telling him. He's throwing down the rod. He's throwing down the staff. He's going to go be the deliverer of God's people. Then it's ten plagues. And then it's a mighty deliverance out of Egypt. Then it's the parting of the Red Sea. Then it's a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now it's up on the mountaintop, the thunderings of God. It's ten commandments written in stone by the very finger of the Lord. It's a tabernacle plan. Do you realize that all of that, from the tabernacle to the ten commandments to the plagues to deliverance to the Red Sea, was all in the bush? There is more in your praise. There is more in your visitations from God than just the chill bumps you feel on the back of your neck. There's more happening when God is setting divine order in your life uh, than what you feel when they're playing the music a little extra loud uh, and the drummer hit the high cymbals uh, a few extra times uh, and you feel a little surge in your spirit. Uh, there's a whole lot more happening uh, than just the surge of your emotion. Uh, that 
little encounter with the bush was going to change Moses forever and be the deliverance of the entire nation of Israel. The prophetic nature of being led by the Spirit usually works in making some small decision that doesn't seem like much, but it contains the full measure of God's plan. I was thinking last night, I shared it with Pastor Williams. Never thought of it before, 36 years now preaching. I told you I assigned myself to be a worship warrior. That was my first assignment in the church. I just put it together last night for the first time ever. The first thing Pastor ever asked me to do, I would check with him on Sunday morning, Pastor, you need anything? No, or go ask sister so-and-so to come or tell brother so-and-so I need to meet him, some errand, some whatever. One Sunday morning, Pastor, you need anything? Yes, step in here. I need you to play the drums today. I said, I don't know how to play the drums. He said, it's all right, I'll teach you. Now, my pastor's idea of that was on the job training. So while I'm over there trying to beat drums and cymbals, pastor's like, that's not right, try something different in the microphone. Too fast, slow it down. Too slow, speed it up. Here, follow my hand. <laughs> I'm over there sweating bullets. You can be sure between that service and the next one, man, I was getting some training. I found me a drummer. You got to show me how to play these drums. That's the way they did it at the old church. But what I put together last night is very interesting. I, I stepped by my own desire into being a worshiper. And my first assignment in the church was on the worship team. I didn't know I was making that decision. I didn't know I was setting the future into place. I didn't know that that one small decision, where it was going to lead and what it was going to do and how my life was going to be changed because of it. I'm just delighting myself in the Lord. Pastor, just needs somebody to play the drums. I'm going to try to figure out how to do it. Sometimes it doesn't seem very important, but it can contain the full measure. God starts leading you. So in 1990, and I'll move quickly to a close. 1990, my wife and I were on the evangelistic field. We went and preached at a small church, and the pastor was leaving. Invited us if we wanted to come and take the church. There was 11 people at that time. I initially said no, and then... Him, Brother Cunningham, just demanded that I pray about it. I'll pray. I prayed a sarcastic prayer. God, they want me to take that church over there. I know you don't want me to take that church, so if it's your will, let me know. And then so, oh, really? Surely not. Long story short, we ended up there living in the basement of the church, a couple Sunday school rooms. We were so poor we couldn't afford to pay attention. Our sanctuary and the little pastor's office was on the second floor. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to be a pastor. I didn't know nothing about anything. I was 25 years old. I knew you probably ought to be praying. That kind of occurred to me. So every day I would go up from our little apartment downstairs, and I'd go into the office. I was skinny. I didn't wear glasses. I always carried a handkerchief. Because I learned early on that I prayed too loud for people and I would upset them because they were carnal and didn't want to pray much. So I got me a handkerchief that I could bury my face in and I could pray as loud as I wanted to pray and it would muffle it so it wouldn't upset the carnal folk. So it became my habit of prayer. I got down on my knees and I buried my face in the handkerchief in the office and I got lost in the spirit. I was praying 30, 45 minutes, never opened my eyes. I'm just out there past the universe, past the Milky Way. I'm out there among the holy coals, glowing angels, lights of many colors. <laughs> I'm way out there in the spirit. You'd be amazed what you could see if you kept your eyes closed long enough. Come to altars and look around. Come and get lost in the Spirit. 
I got lost in it that day. When I finally got done praying, got up off the floor as I was getting up, on my office desk I had a globe. When I saw that globe, the Lord spoke in my spirit. I will carry you across the waters to preach the gospel. I didn't even want to go. I had been an evangelist. Now I'm a pastor. I had a burden for America and for my city. As a matter of fact, in our home church, pastor, my pastor's mission philosophy went something like this. And you're going to think it's a joke, but this is for real. He said, when the missionaries come, folks, if we pay, we can stay. Give them dough, and they'll go. Honestly. So when they put the things up on the screen and stuff, and we got all teary-eyed, and, oh, I said, i got to give these people some money. Go preach to those folks. And we need people that give and people that go, and that was fine. But it never developed in me a burden to ever go overseas. I had no visions of that, no desires of that. But God put it in my heart. I'll carry you across the waters to preach the gospel. I remember getting up and turning the globe, wondering, wondering where I'm going, you know, all the countries and everything spinning around. I forgot about my prayer, went on with my day. Later that afternoon, my friend, Brother Cunningham, he was a new friend in those days. We had just met. We were just meeting. He was the home missions director of Virginia where I was pastoring in Lynchburg. He had just gone to headquarters as secretary of home missions. We had some ideas we'd been talking about, became the church growth department. We're on the phone and we're talking and we're sharing ideas and I was reminding him some things that I was thinking about and some creativity. And while we're talking, I see the globe and I remembered my prayer. And so I say to him on the phone that afternoon, Brother Cunningham, are you, are you going overseas anywhere soon? Well, no, I'm working in the home missions. I said, I felt like the Lord spoke to me this morning that I'd be going overseas. I don't know anything about it. He said, well, I don't know. We finished our conversation, got ready to hung up. He goes, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. He said, you need to call my Uncle Bill. I said, who is your Uncle Bill? He said, my uncle is Billy Cole. I didn't even know that. He said, he's making trips all the time. Maybe you could go somewhere with him. So he gives me the number, and I call over to Brother Cole's house. I have no idea what I'm even doing. I'm a nobody. Sister Cole answers the phone. I start explaining who I am, that I'm a young pastor, that I was praying, felt like the Lord told me I'd be traveling overseas. So then later I was talking to Brother Cunningham, and he said about that point in the conversation, she starts speaking in tongues. And I'm not talking little polite church tongues. I'm talking them ancient Indian warfare tongues, you know. She went off the deep end. So I'm on the phone, yes, oh, Jesus, Jesus, yes, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. And she's talking in tongues. Lost in the Holy Ghost. Then in English, through the tongues I hear, you're the chosen vessel of God. And then she speaks in tongues. And then in English she says, you're the chosen one. And then she speaks in tongues. You're the chosen vessel of God. And then she speaks in tongues. And then she says, I'm going to have Billy call you. And she hung up. We never actually had a conversation. I was trying to tell her what happened to me. She starts speaking in tongues and telling me I'm the chosen vessel. Later that night, Brother Cole called. First time he ever called me. He says, Billy Cole, tell me what has happened to you. So I started into my story. I got about to the same place. He forcefully says, you're the chosen vessel of God. I said, Brother Cole, Sister Cole said, I don't even know what's going on. I don't know what it means. I'll tell you what it means. I am getting ready to go to the nation of Ethiopia. Thousands awaiting my arrival. This week, I have had six members of the team cancel and say they cannot go. So early this morning, I was in my office, and I was praying. And Brother Cole was very dramatic. And he was very dramatic. He said, I had my head in my hands. I was so discouraged. I was so upset. I was completely distraught. And Sister Cole walked into my office, and she raised her hands and prophesied. She said, Billy, 
God will choose a man to travel with you to Ethiopia and he will call you today. Brother Klingdenst, you are that man. Stand with me across this auditorium. I feel a touch of the Holy Ghost. Folks, all I was doing when I put my hand on the knob to the Dolphus door was just trying to do what I thought was right. I didn't know nothing about no Ethiopia. I didn't know nothing about no Billy Cole. I didn't know nothing about worldwide crusades. All I knew was if I'm going to pastor this little church, I ought to probably go upstairs and pray a little bit. I was just delighting myself in the Lord when God put a desire in my heart that connected me to Brother Cole. I traveled with him for 17 years. He became my mentor. Ended up going on lots of crusades, 22 different times. I've seen more than 3,000 people receive the Holy Ghost in a single service. Signs, wonders, and miracles, every miracle of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Many of the places I preach, even till today, I met the people first when I was traveling with Brother Cole. In the year 2000, in Ethiopia, standing next to him after traveling with him for about eight years, he looked at me and said, do you feel powerful? I said, yes, Bishop. Good. And he took his coat off. And he wrapped it around my shoulders. And he laid hands on me. I've got a picture of it at home. I've got the coat now, too, at home. Wrapped his coat around my shoulders, put his hand on my head. And he prayed for me and he said, now go up there and lead this meeting. You're in charge. The mantle of that great man of God come upon me. I know you can't possibly understand. This was one of the greatest men of God in the apostolic movement. I'm a nobody. I'm just from the street. But God ordered steps, connected me to a destiny. Most of the places I preach today was because of some kind of connection through that great man that's going on to be with the Lord. I could have never arranged that. I didn't know what hand to shake. Go to a conference, try to meet the right person. Who's the right person? Who's the person you're supposed to talk to? You don't, if you try to manipulate it, you'll mess it up. God is beyond your understanding. You just get your heart right. You delight yourself in the Lord. You just try to worship and be as pure as you can. And you trust that God is going to order your steps. Tonight is a night of destiny. The altar is open. Somebody needs to come and talk to the Lord and say, here I am. Here I am, Lord. You can get down right where your seat is right there. You can lean forward of the seat in front of you. There's room in the altar up here tonight. There's room where you're standing. I'm going to let them play in just a minute. But I'm telling you, tonight's the night of destiny. I did not know when my knees hit the carpet that morning that I was going to pray a prayer that was going to bring a voice of God, that was going to make a connection with a man, that was going to define my destiny even till now, and even now is affecting my sons, and is going to affect grandsons. You never know where the door is. You never know where the connection is. Your story will be different than my story. Your connection will be different than my connection. Your miracle will be different than my miracle, maybe different than any miracle that I've told tonight. But somewhere in your life, if you will just be led of the Spirit of God, there's an invisible doorway that you're going to walk through into the supernatural. Would you close your eyes and don't open them up for a little while? Just get lost in the Holy Ghost here for a few minutes. Just get lost in the Holy Ghost for a few minutes here. In the mighty name of Jesus. The spirit of the Lord. Somewhere this week, next week, some service, some moment, there's a connection that'll be a definition. Here I am, Lord. Here we are as a church, Lord. Put your 
desires in my heart. Lead me in paths of righteousness. Order my steps, oh God. second time to somebody tonight.
We want to thank you for joining us today and believe with you that God has spoken to you through the sermon and worship. If you have decided today, you know what, I need to give my life to God or recommit to Him, we would love to connect with you, pray with you, and be here with you on your journey in strengthening your relationship with Jesus Christ. Whether that be through a Bible study, baptism, or striving to receive the infilling of the Spirit, we want to connect with you to see the amazing things God is doing and going to do in your life. Or if you have any questions, we want to welcome you to our online family. Go to truevine.live and click connect. If you're worshiping with us on YouTube, just click that subscribe button. Or if you're on Facebook, please like our page. Go ahead right now, comment, and then click the share button. And if this ministry has blessed you, partner with us by giving to God's kingdom here at Truevine. You can give a one-time gift or a recurring donation. The giving options are coming up right after this. We look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. God bless. Thank you.